Chief Minister, thank you very much for, for agreeing to see us today and taking time out of your very busy schedule. It's always um, a pleasure to see you and, and to invite your to politics into number six. Thank you. Thank you very much. I wanted to start by asking you, this last year, which has been your first in office, has it been more difficult than you anticipated? No, I don't think that you can become Chief Minister of Gibraltar without expecting that the workload is going to be overwhelming, that the issues are going to be many and varied, and that it's going to have to require a personal sacrifice and you know, mind-bending uh, problems being put to you. Um, and that's the job that you auditioned for, um, and I've enjoyed every waking and sleeping moment tremendously, believe me. Um, moving on to your colleague, Mr. Charles Busson, how is he doing? Is he Charles is doing really well. I'm very pleased to say that he's doing really well, and I expect he'll be back in the saddle very soon. must be very difficult to, to be sick after you've waited so long to influence political life. Yes, but uh, thank God that uh, he's doing well physically. He's obviously mentally completely up to the job, um, and that hasn't changed because of the physical problem that he's had. All of us have been looking forward to do this job for so long that even a day off with the flu would mm. be a disappointment, and more so having to take some time off for uh, a medical reason like Charles has had to take some time off for. But I, I can tell you he remains fully engaged on all issues, uh, and I'll be seeing him on Sunday when we celebrate a year in office. Oh, we're, we're very glad to hear that he's on the mend. Thank you. Moving on to the <laughs> issue of debt, um, now that you have been able to access the accounts, are things as bad as you first thought during your electoral campaign? Absolutely, but you have to understand why it is and where it is that we're saying the problem lies. We are not saying that the problem lies in recurrent income and expenditure. What we were saying, and we maintain, is that on capital projects in particular, and in companies of the government, there were problems with the way that the companies were meant to be repaying the amounts that they borrowed from the government's general accounts. So the government was owed, when we were elected, a hundred million pounds from companies of the government's own, therefore a 100 million pound hole in the government's finances that I addressed the nation on, I think, in January or February. You did scare, your party did scare the electorate with the hole, the ceiling, and how little there was left to borrow. Would you adopt now a, a lower spending policy considering your, your concerns at that time? Well, we have, and it's not a question of scaring the electorate, because I think that if you tell the electorate the truth, then you're not scaring them, you're actually putting them in the picture. And if you believe in being accountable and transparent, what you can't do is tell people only the things that might cheer them up, but not the things that might cause them concern. Gibraltar is like a small company where we're all in it together and we all need to understand the state in which the company is so that we can make up our minds about what it is that the company can afford to do. And what you can see that we have done in the past year is that there have been no announcements about pharaonic uh, projects that would then not produce income for the government. So I believe that we need to develop a mental health facility which is modern and provides the service that our community deserves. That is the sort of thing the government has to build and is not going to produce income. But we haven't done other things which cost a lot of money and which don't produce income and which are not essential. The main example, of course, is the air terminal. You ask any Gibraltarian whether they prefer the old air terminal or the new one, and I think they're all going to tell you the new one is a much uh, preferable building. Our argument always was, was that the right way to spend 84 million uh, euros before developing the new mental health hospital, for example? But the development of, a, of an airport is something that will last for decades, even possibly a century or so. Wouldn't and you so have considered that too? so would a, a mental to... health facility. Um, the last one has lasted many more decades than it should. This is the argument. How about the fact that you were pretty much willing to spend 80 odd million on the estates, which is something that didn't come to fruition, but... Why do you say that? Well, I, I understand that the, the works have been halted. Not at all. We're in the process of developing those works and starting the process of providing for our people the estates that they deserve. I mean, look, you've got places like Laguna Estate, there is one particular block at the Guna Estate, I think it's Blackwatch, I'm not sure of, of the name, that has never been repainted from the day it was handed over to the government back in the 60s. Right? We have got to do that work. Putting the spending priorities of the government in order means that that work has to start and has to move apace so that the people of Gibraltar who live in those estates, the estates that we've called the forgotten estates, do have the living environment that they deserve. 
Now, whether it's going to cost 80 million, 90 million, or 70 million, and the, the final design of that is something that we're talking to all of the tenants' associations about. But I don't know where you get the idea that we're not progressing with that. I mean, you shouldn't believe everything that some of our political opponents say. First of all, they're not clearly read up on things. And second, I find that they tend to make most of things up. Well, this is the other subject that we wanted to ask you about, which is the matter of bickering in Parliament and um, all these ping-pongs of, of uh, press releases that keep coming backwards and forwards. How do, you, how do you see that? You proposed a Westminster style of government, and yet we see too much pettiness coming. Well, but Malen, with respect, that is the Westminster style of government. I don't believe that it's petty when we're taking issue with each other on policy issues. I don't like to see people calling each other names. I would call that personal bickering. I think that is completely irrelevant to our political debate. But it happens but all the time. No, 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 I don't think it does. If you look at government press releases, and if you look previously at GSLP liberal press releases, you look at exactly what we say and we take up issue with the policy. We usually didn't get a reply from the Gibraltar Social Democrats, which amounts usually to an ignoring of the substance of matters and somebody getting called a name on the GSLP liberal side. And we then respond because there's only one way to deal with bullies, of course, and that's to take them up at their so, own game. So you but but the, the, the clash of policies... Look, we have an adversarial style. It's different to, to, to say that you have an adversarial style, to say that you have a, a ping-pong of press releases, which is the same adversarial style that there is in London under the Westminster system. I think that's the best possible system for Gibraltar. However, in, in the UK, we don't see this type of... In your administration, you used to do this, and in my administration, we used to do that. And there's a lot of that going on. I'm and sorry, the man I'm on afraid the I, I can't accept that. You the haven't been following street. English politics for no. the past two years, if you believe that people aren't being told to look back at the previous administration. Every day, the Prime Minister or the Chancellor say to the leader of the opposition, it was the Labour Party that left us this debt. Right, but and, the, and man the, Labour the, Party is, talk about other the man in the street is fed up of hearing mm -hmm. cross-party bickering. How would you propose to well, make, you, to you make see, Gibraltar feel like it's less... No, I'm sorry, cross-party bickering is essential in an adversarial system based on the Westminster, Westminster model of, of politics. If people don't want to hear parties trying to point out where the deficiencies of each other's policies are, then they need to policies sweep or away personalities. policies. I don't believe in having arguments over personalities, but if one is attacked, then you need to defend yourself. But the important thing is that you test policies in an adversarial system by trying to understand where they are weakest. I sincerely believe that we play the bull and not the man. Now, I said that and my opponents have started to say that actually it's quite the opposite because we sometimes have to refer to things that individuals have done. If you look at how we do our politics, we always play the bull, not the man. Then usually the other man comes and kicks us in the shin. And when that happens, we reply in kind because that's the only way to deal with bullies. Were you playing the man at Gibraltar today in London when you couldn't resist to have a dig at Mr. Peter Gadwana? I don't understand why you think that's a dig, because to say that I've invited the leader of the opposition is to show that I am taking the inclusive approach that I said I would. I said last year in London that if I was the chief minister, I would invite the leader of the opposition, and I reminded all those who were there that I actually had, had fulfilled that commitment. Why is it that if I say that, I'm trying to, in Perhaps some way, because denigrate. the message to people from the outside, not Gibraltarians, is that we are not showing a united front coming out of Gibraltar. I, I believe maybe it's something you could have said in Gibraltar, but to the outside community. Oh, Malen, look, today, anybody can log on to Gibraltar politics wherever they are in the world. They can log on to the Gibraltar Chronicle. They can watch GBC TV live, or they can even watch it after a program has been transmitted. This idea that we have to be so... Uh, protected from the outside world, that we only talk about issues of dispute between us in Gibraltar, I think is a bit old-fashioned in the modern globalized environment in which we live. But I must tell you, when I said that I had invited Peter uh, Gafalana to attend Gibraltar Day in London, as I had committed myself to do, I was simply confirming that if he wasn't there, it wasn't because I hadn't invited him. And I had a conversation with Peter about this, and I hoped that he would have been there. And I have always said, in respect of Mr. Kahana missing uh, parliamentary sessions or um, not coming to London, that if he has not come, I'm sure that having given 16 years to Gibraltar, there must be a very good reason why he's not turning up today. I've never made a criticism of his failure to turn up to these events. So you agree that when we leave Gibraltar as such, when we're in the international forum, 
we should all stand together and united. Well, to the extent that I believe that all of us need to stand up for what we believe. And if we are all standing up together to defend the same principles and in international fora, those principles seem to be the common ones to all of us, then there's no need to take dispute. But I'm not afraid of taking my position, even if it's contrary to a political adversaries, outside of Gibraltar if I have to. With regards to your government um, being accused of wanting to be all things to all men, a populist approach to government, how would you say this fares with your, with your cabinet? Um, do you consider yourself to be a populist see, administration? It's so cheap to have to face criticisms like that which are really not thought out. Um, if you look at what the opposition is saying, it's saying so many disparate things. It may be because of the different attempts at taking over the leadership of that party that we're getting all of these different messages. One part of our political opponent's party says that we're all things to all men. The other, thing, the other part says that we are just ruling to favor GSLP members and then we're corrupt because we're doing that. They've really got to make up their mind. Neither of those are true. And you know, cheap shots don't get you anywhere. Let's get to the substance of what my government has done in the past year. I think it's been a great year for Gibraltar. On the subject of employment, as you may know, in the Gibraltar politics group, some youths have come out stating publicly that prior to the elections and at GSLP headquarters, they were promised work which they still haven't obtained. What would you say to these people and to our viewers about this state of affairs? That it's not true. I was there at the party political headquarters when we were designing the future job strategy. I know exactly what the future job strategy was designed to deliver. I know what everybody was told before the election. It's exactly the same thing they're being told after the election. It's quite another thing what it is that people might A, have wanted to hear, or B, are being told that they were told by our political opponents. This idea that there was a guarantee of a government job given to people. Look, this is absolute poppycock, and you don't do politics based on poppycock. You do politics based on reality, and the position in respect of the future job strategy is clearly set out in our leaflets before the election and in our manifesto. That is the political position. Would you argue that the future job strategy is a success and not a failure? It's a complete success. And I'll tell you when you will judge it. You will judge it not today. You'll judge it before the next general election when we look at the number of Gibraltarians employed compared to the, day, the numbers just before the last general election. And there I think it would be impossible for people to make an argument that the future job strategy has been anything other than a success. But let me tell you this. If you are somebody who uh, finds themselves on the housing waiting list, 1,500 people on the housing waiting list, when we were elected on the 9th of December. There were 200 when the GSLP left office in 1996, or 1,200 people unemployed when we were elected on the 9th of December. And to all of those people, my words that they will be able to judge our policies as success or failure in three years' time when the next general election comes, might sound a bit hollow, because if you need a job and you need a home, you don't want to wait three years to get them. But look, the, the political reality is that you cannot fix structural problems like the ones that we have been bequeathed by the GSD on housing and on jobs in five minutes. One reader wrote, when will you allow decent hardworking people a chance to apply for government jobs and drop this crazy FJS scheme when normal people are now discriminated against and have no chance of bettering themselves? You can't deny that there are a lot of people who are dismayed with the FJS scheme. And well, very let, me, let me tell you why. Let me tell you why that reader has made that comment. Because she believes, or he believes, I, I don't know who the reader is, that people in the FJS are taking jobs that would be available to individuals who might wish to apply to work in the government. But that's not true. That may be what our political opponents want you to think. But if you look at the reality, we've got trainees in government that are covering posts that are not posts that would come out to the general public for them to apply for jobs. And we've got trainees who are being allowed extended work experience in government so that they can apply later for jobs in the private sector. So nobody in the future job strategy is taking a job from anybody in the public sector. So if there are people outside government who wish to work in government, when those jobs are available, they will have the chance to apply. But of course our political opponents seem to be doing a good job of confusing people. So Look, you're confident that by the end of your term, all these expectant FJS workers will be dealt with and satisfied and happy with your modus operandi. On I understand why, why you ask me that question and it is because we have had a, a government for the past four previous terms that saw manifestos as pipe dreams that they might try and fulfill. 
My position has been clear, not just in respect of the future job strategy, but everything else in our manifesto. I was, am, and remain confident that every single one of the commitments in our manifesto will be completed by the time that I call the next general election, including, in particular, those on housing and jobs, which are the ones that affect people's lives most dramatically. On the subject of the social media, how important do you believe has the impact been of the social media in the last general election campaign? I think it's been very important. I think people have been able to express themselves in social media in a way that they might not have been able to express themselves otherwise. You've got to be careful not to overstate the importance of social media. For me, social media is just that. It is not the mainstream media. It is not a news service. It's just a place where people give their opinions and share their views. The interesting thing, of course, is that perhaps all of this was happening before social media. People might get together in a pub and say the things that they say on social media. There was, of course, a difference that the things they might have said to each other would have been slander, which is not actionable, whilst when you put it down and you type it out and everybody sees it, it may be liable if it's not true and if it's unfair about someone. But forgetting that sort of legal way of looking at it, these are the things that people are saying to each other about the issues. They would have said it over a pint or over a coffee before. Now they're saying it in a way that all of us can see what people think. I think that's hugely important because it really spreads the political debate. Yes, but it opens up your administration right now to a lot of scrutiny because things are written black upon white. People are having conversations that the whole world can gain yeah, access to. Right. So I would believe that you are more accountable no, in a no, sense. No, if I may say so, uh, Malen, um, I think my um, administration is open to scrutiny and accountability because it wishes to be and that is how we want to do our politics and, and we'll come on to that no doubt in a few minutes. But I think that what people say on social media actually discloses to the administration where it is that the ignorance is about our policies. So for example, in the future job strategy where you, you've raised an issue, I think we are failing to explain some parts of the future job strategy because if people still have this impression, then those who want the future job strategy to fail are succeeding in confusing some. I think most people understand the future job strategy and are very happy with how it's working but some obviously are um, confusing some of the issues there. So what it tells me as a politician is, this is where we need to explain more clearly what we're doing. That's the great value so of social media. So you consider it a constructive tool. You don't consider Absolutely. it, you are an avid Facebook user. You Absolutely. don't consider it distracting or counterproductive in any way. Not at all. I mean, neither do I think, and I know that, um, that some people from the other party consider that if I read Gibraltar politics, um, or somebody in my office decides that they want to bring something in Gibraltar politics to my attention because they happen to be a member. We are monitoring it and Big Brother is watching. Well, look, Big Brother is watching insofar as Big Brother reads the Chronicle every morning. Big Brother reads the Panorama and sees what people write there. And Big Brother happens to be a member of Gibraltar politics and reads that and everything else that he can get his hands on because he loves politics and this is what he does, right? So if I read something there which I think is wrong, I say to myself, why has my government failed to explain that? Or if I read something there which worries me, I'll ask a question inside the administration and say, is this true, has this happened, and why has it? So I think it's hugely val valuable because it's like being able to sit at the piazza and listen to every single conversation going on and understand the concerns affecting everyone in our community. You wouldn't be tempted to blacklist any individual who is constantly pounding your administration or being adversarial towards your government? Would You're that here, aren't you? <laughs> Not I'm at all. I'm just a contributor. Look, I spent um, 20 years in politics to the day before I was elected Chief Minister. In every single moment of those 20 years, the politics that I've wanted to bring is the politics of openness, accountability, transparency, and of tolerance and respect for different people's views. The fact that somebody may uh, write something about one of my policies which is just untrue is not going to affect whether or not I believe that they should get a tender or they should get a contract or anything like that. They should get a tender or they should get a contract if they are the best person for the job, if they give us the best value for money for our community. That's the Gibraltar that you live in since the 9th of December last year. So people can write what they like on Jib politics, on all of the social media that they wish to write on, and they're not going to suffer at all any discrimination at the hands of my government. That's not to say that I might not take them up if they say something which is untrue 
or wrong about one of my policies. I'm that's sure politics, that they'd enjoy it? your engagement. Well, I mean, I can't engage on the, on the social media sites because I don't have the time. But I may want to write to someone and say, hey, this is the reality. You seem to be concerned about a particular issue. Here you have the data so that you can make up your minds for yourselves. Um, everybody has the right to freedom of speech and freedom of expression, including the chief minister. How about, though, for example, the controversy that surrounded Dr. John Cortez's announcement, for example, about the 1999 fishing no agreement on all. Facebook? No controversy at Would, all. Are you okay with one of your members? I hope you're not. Uh, you're not following the uh, lexicon of what happens in Gibraltar politics, politics based based on what it is that our political opponents say. As I've said till I'm blue in the face, what John Cortez did was put on Facebook what was already a decision communicated to the whole wide world and therefore I think it's absolutely what, proper they should have done so. On what platform was it already communicated? On our, in our manifesto he was reflecting as he had done in the past and he has done since then when people have raised issues that are dealt with in our manifesto he has told them what was contained in our manifesto but in any event I would have thought I would have thought that as a champion of social media you would be delighted to see us communicating those issues if to this, uh, if members the, if, of these pages. If you state that everything in your manifesto will be a given, then perhaps, but one would think that they would be announced in Parliament oh, or no, no, on no, the sorry. press. Or no, not at all, not at all. Everything in my manifesto, as I have said repeatedly, and quite contrary to what Mr. Kahana specifically Is said given? was his position, everything in our manifesto will be completed before the next general election. And that particular commitment that you're talking about actually says immediately upon our election. So it was immediately a given. On the subject of phishing, do you think that instead of ha having announced and placed those restrictions first and the negotiations later, which we all saw your hard work with, with members of the, of the Spanish fishing groups, would you not have thought in retrospect that perhaps the negotiations should have come first and then the restrictions? No, and I'll tell you why. I've answered this question already and I've answered it twice to uh, Mr. Fetum in Parliament, so I'm surprised to hear you ask exactly the same question in almost exactly the same words as he used because I'm going to give you exactly the same answer, which is that I believe that the law of Gibraltar must be observed and that one cannot negotiate or postpone when the rule of law is re-established in Gibraltar. But if one believes that to have an agreement with Spanish, Moroccan or Portuguese people that they are able to break our laws is a breach of the rule of law, then you cannot tolerate that whilst you negotiate with them how it is that they're going to remedy that breach. But we, as a small place, don't we have to pick our battles and maintain the goodwill which would have perhaps been better maintained by having these negotiations before the restrictions? I saw Gemma Araujo last month. I'm going to see her again this month. The relationship with Alinea is excellent. The relationship with Algeciras, as you know, is, is led for Algeciras by Mr. Landalusa, who is the biggest antagonist on the issue of Gibraltar since, um, since we have been in a democracy in Spain. So I don't think that the fishing issue has really affected the relationship with the Partido Popular-led nation of Spain, with the Socialist Party-led Ayuntamiento of La Lenia, or with the Partido Popular-led uh, Algeciras municipality. The fact is that there were always going to be problems with the Partido Popular government in Spain. I think we're doing very well in respect of the fishing. And I must tell you, I believe that the rule of law is paramount. Because perhaps it's because I'm a lawyer first and a politician second. And therefore, I do not accept that there should be agreements that people can break Gibraltar law. I would rather not be Chief Minister of Gibraltar than be involved in agreements that people from outside Gibraltar or even in Gibraltar can break Gibraltar law. My position on that is clear, it's principled and it's fundamental to who I am as an individual and a politician. So for me there's but absolutely no question all this about of breaking, negotiating people all with this people about before breaking this. Gibraltar law is, is very open f uh, from your part. But at the end of the day, it all boils down to enforcement, and the electorate are very dismayed that the RGP isn't enforcing the I law. So we can say as much as we want, no, no, breaking no, no, no. the law, but where is the enforcement, no, no, no. and who is in charge First of First of all, I don't think you speak for the electorate. First of all. Second, there are lots of people who would like to see the RGP doing more. I am one of those people, but I also have to understand that the RGP don't have the tools to do more at the moment. Look, you have to understand that when I was elected on the 9th of December, the RGP only had at their disposal an old launch called the Sir William Jackson. I think the Sir Joshua Hassan, if you'll excuse me, was on the hard because it hadn't been repaired for some time. And two, um, confiscated ribs which they had taken from drug smugglers. 
Since then, they have acquired two new fast launchers, which we agreed that they could acquire immediately after our election and were delivered four or five months later. They are acquiring, I hope by the end of next week, a much larger vessel, which we procured within months of being elected. There is another much larger vessel on its way. The Customs Department is going to see their maritime assets hugely upgraded, and the Environmental Department will have to have more assets put at their disposal so they can do some of the work so that we want them to do. Without assets, we don't want the RGP, I'm sure, any of us, but it's a matter always for, for Eddie Yomi, to put themselves at risk by pretending to do things that they can't, or starting operations that they can't complete. But it's always going to be a matter for the Commissioner of Police to decide when they act and how they act. My obligation as Chief Minister of Gibraltar and as Chairman of the Cabinet that meets here every Monday is to ensure that they have the resources available to take those actions when they think they should. They're going to have who, them very who shortly. Will give, who will give them instructions? Are they under... Oh, the only person who can give the police instructions are, is the Governor? Commissioner of Police. Governor of Gibraltar? Certainly not. I mean, you have to understand how the police works. That's clearly set out in our law. And neither the Governor nor the Chief Minister will give them so they, they will take their own, their own initiative as to when and how they enforce and you're saying that they Absolutely needed a more right. robust infrastructure which they now have. Absolutely right. So in the next few months we should see them taking more proactive measures. Well in, in order the next to few months they will have the assets to take more proactive measures should they believe and uh, through their hierarchy consider it is appropriate that they should. But there certainly won't be any interference with me on that subject. How do you see things in general for the next three years? What is your immediate vision for the rest of your term in office? Well, you know, we have been uh, groundbreaking as uh, an administration. I'll tell you why. When we came in, we came in with a manifesto that was 80 pages long, and it detailed exactly what it was that we saw as our vision for Gibraltar. I'm very surprised to hear one of the more junior members of the opposition say that my government doesn't have a vision for Gibraltar. My government has had the most extensively set out clear and uh, objective vision for Gibraltar because our manifesto provides very clearly what we're going to do in the lifetime of this parliament. What has happened? I know that senior civil servants, all of the heads of department, have a copy of our manifesto on their desk because this sets out where each department is going in the next three years. I would have said four, but it's now, it's now a year since we were elected. So that vision sets out exactly where Gibraltar needs to be, socially, culturally, in terms of jobs, in terms of housing, in terms of health. We predict exactly what the size of the economy is going to be in four years' time. We predict what our debt is going to be, both gross and our approach but you don't to give the calculation of net as debt. As to your costs of things that you're going to be, as you're going to be making Nobody ever projects. Does. Nobody ever does because... And in Parliament? See, I myself have heard in Parliament yes. questions on, on, on prices and costs and no, I haven't... Uh, Malen, you've got to understand what it is that is going on here, right? The opposition is not asking us, what does the government think it is going to cost, right? The opposition is asking us, what did the GSLP think it was going to cost when you prepared the manifesto? It's a long-established principle of parliamentary democracy that the government answers only for the government, not for the political party and what you thought before you were the government. Now, when we are asked, what is the budget going to be for these projects, there's a specific debate where those things have to happen. And look, it's one thing to be open and accountable and transparent, which we are more than any government ever has been. Now, I think it's to be played for a fool, and my government is not going to be played for a fool. The opposition have an opportunity at budget time to ask us questions about all of these projects. At question time, they can ask us specific questions about specific projects and where the information is available and it's not commercially sensitive, it is given. But before you go out to tender for some projects, we're not going to say what we think it's going to cost because if we do that, where's the value for money for the taxpayer? If I said to Selwyn Figueres, given his repeated insistence, we now believe that the Commonwealth Park is going to cost X million and it's going out to tender for the works, etc., etc., in the next uh, three months or in the next six months. Do you think any tenderer would tender less than X million? We would I have understand. set out what the bottom price is. Now, it's quite another thing Couldn't to ask the government how much has it cost. And, of course, there the government replies as soon as the accounts well, are ready. Couldn't you propose a ballpark figure that you're willing to spend? As but, Malen, I mean, I think that really is contrary to the interest of the taxpayer because the minute you do that, then the tenderer knows what your ballpark is. You know, I think it, it's really and quite what about, but there are unnecessary projects, to do this. But there are projects that have been done and dusted, finished, and the government has 
dragged its heels to give like figures which? and costs. There are few, I, I hear Dr. John Cortez sometimes, for example, talking about not having his figures on him and... and no, no, that's not fair. I mean, uh, please uh, don't say things which are not correct because you can go back to Hansard and see that what John has said, and in this instance about the Al Gore project, was that some of the costs were not yet in and we were being asked for full costs and some of the costs were not yet in. And before Al Gore had come to Gibraltar, whilst we were still trying to negotiate and tweak prices, we were being asked to give a budget before he had come to Gibraltar. Look, believe me, if you go on the Gibraltar government website, you will see today all of the data that you can imagine you might want on hundreds of different statistical issues, which we as an opposition had to ask the GSD government for on the three occasions or two sometimes that we had a meeting of parliament for every year. We give all that data out. And whenever we see that they're asking questions about statistical information, we add that statistical information to the data that's available publicly. All of the information is there. Now, we are having monthly meetings of the parliament. If Al Gore had come under Peter Carvana's administration in January, I would have had a chance to ask a question about how much it cost in June. And if the accounts hadn't been ready then, I would have had a chance to ask again in October. And if the accounts had not been ready then, I would have had a chance to ask again perhaps in December. The problem is that when you have a parliamentary democracy as open and transparent as ours, the as the GSLP Liberal government yes. has delivered to Gibraltar, Salvin Figueres gets to ask every four weeks because in his imagination there are very few questions and he's asking this one constantly. That doesn't mean that the government is less transparent. It's quite the opposite. We're giving the information. And it's important that we should give it because we don't want to be open and transparent or pretend to be and then not give information like this. But you have to get the information right and it's got to be accurate. Um, Chief Minister, we're going to move now to some direct questions from some of our readers. I'll, I will read just this first one out to you from Matt Raven. When will you be introducing the Freedom of Information Act? As you so rightly stated in your manifesto, the government belongs to you and you should not be controlled for the benefit of a privileged few. The freedom of information is also one of the best ways to prevent corruption and bad practice in government. Quote. In fact, there are already um, advanced drafts of the legislation which have to be checked for constitutionality. The United Kingdom model is not exactly the model that we can adopt in Gibraltar. So I accept that that act will be introduced into the parliament. Well, rather, it will be published as a command paper because it's a new piece of legislation. It will have to go to command paper so that people can make their comments. I expect in the first quarter of next year, if not earlier. Um, another question here from Leslie Kehoe Benrimo. Mm -hmm. When are we actually going to hear answers to questions put by the opposition in Parliament without waffle? As soon as you open your ears, Leslie. And I know that you're a member of the GSD and you defend everything that they do, um, however wrong they may have been. So I'm not surprised that you want to attack me, however much we may do that's right. But that's the plurality and the beauty of politics. So long may it continue. It is endemic, though, in any government that in Parliament they will kind of evade questions here and there and get on with the job perhaps um, mm -hmm. in the background and not necessarily want to give too much away? Is it? I mean, I, that's not my model of government. I mean, this is what we see until things come to fruition well, sometimes. Well, no, because, because you see what, what question time cannot be is an opportunity for the opposition to say to you, you know, where exactly are you in the development of this particular paragraph of your manifesto? I know that we have shut the opposition up greatly by setting out so clearly what it is that we're going to be doing for the next four years and they seem to concentrate only on asking us where we are in a particular paragraph of our manifesto. But you look at the Prime Minister's question time on Wednesdays on the BBC and you see what the opposition do there and how, how they hold the government to account and you see what it is that the GSD is doing in Gibraltar and I say to myself who on earth is telling uh, people like Damon Bosino that they're delivering value for money in opposition. All they're doing is asking the same questions over and over again. Fair enough, but when you think about when you were in opposition, mm -hmm. how would you describe the differences of your opposition to the opposition of today? Well, I have to tell you, I think I did an excellent job in opposition. I became leader of the opposition in April and I was chief minister by December. Congratulations on that one. Thank you. Very fast going. But I'm asking about in Parliament, your way of, of, of behaving and your way of, of addressing questions. Look, Where I'm, is I'm the difference? We were, we were only given the opportunity to ask questions twice in one year in an election year, three times a year when there wasn't an election. So the questions were completely different because they, were not, they could not be topical questions because time had uh, 
passed between an event happening and the opportunity to ask questions. Mr. Caruana's style in answering questions was truly evasive. I mean, I invite anybody to go back and read the Hansards of what Mr. Caruana was like answering questions in Parliament. It was very difficult to get anything out of the GSD. It was literally getting blood out of a stone. I'll tell you something which, which uh, I remember with fondness. Ernest Brito said to me once in Parliament when I asked him a question, he said, oh, that's got nothing to do with me. I didn't make that decision. I said, come on, Minister, this is your responsibility. Who made the decision? And he said to me, in what I hope was a slip of the tongue, or with his tongue firmly in his cheek, he said, oh, that's, that was a decision made by central government. Well, as you know, in Gibraltar, we only have one government, and my government certainly operates on the basis of cabinet responsibility. We all make our decisions together. That makes it even funnier when I hear people say that there is a government within a government in Gibraltar, that there is more than one. That's a, that complete joke is illustrated as being completely false in respect of my government and completely true about Mr. Caruana's government by earnest tongue-in-cheek or slip-of-the-tongue comment in answer to questions that time in Parliament. I think the statement that you've just made, I would draw the connection with, with the talk of when people say that you and Mr. Bossano are having this tug of war as <laughs> one GST. Uh, Unfortunately, and as you can see, I'd win because in terms of weight, um, I've got it on Joe. <laughs> Not in terms of political weight, but in terms of physical weight, I've got it on Joe. It's just ridiculous. And if people want to conduct opposition politics on the basis of fiction, rumor, and innuendo, it's a matter for them. When the time comes, People always, at election time, look at substance. And when they look at substance, they will see a government that has worked together in cabinet, not just with Joe and Fabian, but with Joe, Fabian, Joseph, Paul, Charles, John, Samantha, you know, all of us working together, Stephen, Neil, Gilbert, delivering on our manifesto. That's what people want. Yes, but different figures have been recorded, as being said, the GDP, well, last week's viewpoint, figures that you yourself have, has, um, have predicted have been different to those that Mr. Bossano have predicted. In what sense? Well, I don't have, as um, some ministers have said, I don't have the figures on me right now, but I can tell you for a fact that different figures, conflicting figures, have been put no, out there. No, hang on, look. This is First of all, that when, when ministers say that they don't have figures on them, it's when they're answering supplementary questions which deviate so far from the question that's been provided that nobody could be expected to have the information, not because they're trying to be evasive, right? So I have to deal with that issue that you're putting. You know, most of the figures in the GSLP manifesto, if not all of the figures relating to GDP and growth, were developed by Mr. Bosana, who, as you know, was the leader of the opposition for many years, Minister for Finance when he was Chief Minister, etc. Um, so there's no question of us being on anything other than exactly the same page. If our political opponents like to think for their own purposes that we're not, I'm delighted that they should continue to labor under that misapprehension because our success is going to hit them like a juggernaut between the eyes when the time of the next general election is called comes. Javier Vasquez asks, I would ask the CM, if you had a magic wand and you were able to undo a decision already taken by government which has not gone to your liking and the electorate's liking without resulting in negative feedback, which policy decision would you reverse? I would have also asked the same question to PRC when he was CM. None. It's early days. I've still got three years to make mistakes. I don't think we've got it wrong yet. Would you admit them? Uh, well, ask me in three years' time. Maybe I'll have a, a chance then to consider my answer. Dennis Alcantara asks, when are you going to tell some of your followers that you are leader of the GSLP and CM of Gibraltar and not Mr. Bosano? I find it disrespectful to you is what we were just talking about. I, d I don't find it disrespectful. I don't think that there is an issue. Neither Joe nor I consider that there's an issue. And frankly, you know, we just get on with it, despite the, the rumors that the opposition want to put out there to try and upset people and all the rest of it. Sonia Gold asks, what is your biggest political nightmare at this moment as you approach your year in office? Well, um, my biggest political nightmare, well, that's a good question. Um, I suppose that if I set it out, it would give the persons, states, or, or entities who might be able to bring it about a clue. So I think I'd better keep it to myself. Fair enough. Um, Elton Moreno asks, Gibraltar is and has been rife with nepotism. Is this going to change any time soon, or will nepotism remain? It changed on the 9th of December. People now get jobs, contracts, or any advantage, only based on their deserving those contracts, jobs, or advantages, and no other reason whatsoever. 
But people maintain that promotions have been given without going through the proper channels. Not Would true. you invite these people to write to you and, and, and name call and, and express their dissatisfaction? Absolutely. Absolutely, because it is not true. Let me tell you that when I was elected on the 9th of December, I found that this had actually occurred on a lot of occasions. And I've told Peter Carvana in Parliament that I've seen exactly how nepotic his government was in many instances. There have been absolutely zero instances where we have delivered on any promotion, any advantage, any tender, anything based on nepotism or connection with us in any particular way. And anybody who puts um, any of those issues to us will have an answer. The, the talk about the bus company, a okay. certain gentleman shall being I, promoted. Shall I, shall I answer Please, that question? Please, go ahead. I've answered it in Parliament on a thousand occasions, but this gives me an Some opportunity. Some of our readers may not listen well, to Parliament. This gives me an opportunity <laughs> of, of, of talking directly to... I don't see people on social networks as readers. I see them as participants. So I will, I will tell your participants the, the answer that we have given in Parliament on a number of occasions. Thank you. In the bus company there was a promotion available. It was opened to a number of people to apply. They applied. A board was appointed, independent of politicians, and the board made recommendations to the uh, government. So, sorry, to the, to the company directors or to the minister. What happened there was that the recommendations of the board were accepted. Right? Now, this has given rise to a lot of talk because apparently, of the two people promoted, one individual has appeared on the social network favoring the opposition. Well, sorry, the, the GSLP, the opposition, because it used to favor us before we were in government, right? And this gentleman has a name, and everybody knows what it is. Now, if the board had recommended somebody else, and we had appointed him, then I could see there might be an argument for saying the government has behaved nepotically. But if we've actually accepted the recommendation of the board, the board says these are the best people for the job and we accept them, well then that's not behaving nepotically. Let me tell you something else because this is a bit that people don't like to reflect upon and that our political opponents don't like to talk about. There were three applicants. One individual was not promoted. That individual is related to a GSLP minister. Of three applicants, two got promoted. One of them nobody complains about. One of them happened to have supported the government when it was the opposition. And the third one, the one that lost out, is related to a GSLP minister. Look, actually, I think that people need to ask themselves again whether they can see any of the indicia of nepotism here. If the person who was related to the minister had been promoted, then I could see that an argument to say, are you sure that you've done this in a way that is objective? It's quite the opposite. But of course, that fact doesn't seem to be percolating because it's not in the interest of our political opponents that it percolates. On the subject of civil service reform, at the start of your term, you announced the first stages of the civil service reform. How is that coming along? It's going very well. I'm working with UNITE and I'm working with the GGCA on a lot of the subjects that are, are politically relevant. The Chief Secretary is also working with subcommittees to try and, and bring the process along as quickly as possible. It's a tougher job than we expected because there are lots of... Uh, of um, flequillos, as you might say, that need to be dealt with before we can bring everything together. The Gibraltar Teachers Association is working with Gilbert Likudi, who's the Minister for Education, but all of that needs to uh, gravitate around general orders and issues which are common to all the three unions and all the different grades of public servants that there are there. there I sincerely hope that we're going to be able to make important announcements about progress on the civil service review during the course of the coming year. There is a strong belief that many in the private sector already think that the civil service is overmanned due to the growth it saw during the GSD's time in office. However, since the alliance has come into office, as you pr uh, pretty much state, it has continued to grow. Don't you think this is an unnecessary drain on our economy? It, it hasn't grown. What's happened is that we have filled vacancies that were empty. But I gave a commitment in my manifesto, that in our manifesto. That is growth in a sense, is it no, not? No, because if you, look, we have a commitment to maintain the manning levels of the civil service, right? If what we do is we fill the vacancies, is what we're doing is giving effect to that manning level. That's not growth. It's growth when you add vacancies and when you add posts, right? Now, I think that the future of the civil service is to grow in some areas and to reduce in some others because as e-government comes into the equation, there are some places where things will be done much more easily, much more electronically, much more fluidly, and therefore there won't be a need for so many bodies. But in other areas, there will be need for more bodies, and in fact, in some areas, e-government will create more work rather than less work. 
So that's a very fluid process where we're working with the trade unions, all the relevant trade unions. You, you, might say, you, you might say, that, I'll come to that in a minute, you might say that there is in the employment of the 47 extra teachers an increase in the manning level in the education department. But look, that was something we were committed to because we think that's the best investment we can make, educating our children to the standard that we've come to expect in Gibraltar. And that meant continuing to put pressure on class sizes to come down and continuing to ensure that people were not taken for a ride as they were before the election, with people being employed as temporary employees on supply, but actually working every single day as if they were permanent employees. You want to ask me about joint ventures? Yes, I just wanted to ask what the position is um, with regards to your policies on, on taking on these joint ventures and growing them and how... Well, I think the, the, the approach that we are taking is that we want to work in partnership with the private sector wherever it's possible. But we're not going to do that in terms of privatizing what it is that the government already does. But in new areas of activity, we are looking for uh, the private sector to be our partner in delivering to the general public. And I think that's a very good thing. On the, on the subject of um, capital projects, which we touched upon just a tad just earlier, um, this is the heartbeat of our economy. And have you got these inwards investors that you said that we, we would be seeing before the elections? Yes, uh, indeed. And how would you, how would you um, reconcile this with the fact that the construction industry has come to a... a it's very simple. I'll explain hold. it to you in detail so that you understand the position. Most of what was going on in Gibraltar last year was programmed to end before the 8th of December because the previous administration, rightly, wanted to deliver on their projects before the date of their re-election. So you have a lot of construction activity going on funded by the government as capital or infrastructure projects aiming to complete on the 8th of December or before. The airport being the biggest case in point, housing, etc., 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 right? We come in, a lot of those projects are completed. Some of them are at the tail end at the time that we are elected. And our projects now start to get traction. You can be elected nowadays into government with all the architectural drawings ready to go and everything you, know, you think ready to lay the first brick. But of course, when you're elected, you find You've got to do an environmental impact assessment, a scoping study, all of the things that modern legislation requires, which you can't do from opposition. A change of so government perhaps makes you look like the bad guys to no, these construction well, not employees. At all. I, not at all, and I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. That process starts, in fact, um, on Monday you will see that tender documents are coming out to start the development of housing, and other tender documents will now start to appear because the 11 months that have passed, we've not been idle. We've been getting ready to issue these documents so that the work can start. I imagine that 2013 will be a very busy year for some people who have not been so busy this year. And that's the process. And that's the way it should be. Of course, all our projects are designed to be delivered where possible before the next general election. Yeah. So again, there will be that uh, upscaling of construction activity and after the election, are less. Are they on board but, with you, the construction but, industry? But Do they understand Hang on, let me, let me just explain this. Let me just explain this last bit whether there might have been a GSD government or a GSLP government after the 9th of December. Because those projects had been completed, there were no other projects to go to. Now, the tunnel was stopped already by the GSD and might not have continued because they were tied up in litigation. All of these things were accounted for in a particular way. Construction companies know that they cannot consider the government to be the only client in town. In the last three years before the last general election, the GSD spent in three years more than they had spent in the previous 13 put together. That is a recipe. We were to have continued that level of activity for us to find ourselves on a Greek precipice. And I wasn't going to put Gibraltar there. That's why, as you'll see, we're looking for private sector partners for the projects that are coming out in the coming months and years. Well, can you tell us about the position with GJBS? What, what do I need to tell you about that? Is, is this has something to do with the, the caretaker, the decisions oh, made? Oh, I see, right. Um, well, what I've said already. I mean, <laughs> look, the position is very clear. In 1996, it was the 1969 constitution that applied. In 1988, it was the 1969 constitution that applied. And in 1972, it was the 1969 constitution that applied. Those are the years where elections have been held under the 1969 constitution. In 2011, the 2006 Constitution applied. The 2006 Constitution has a clause 
which is very clear. It says the caretaker government cannot, once an election is called, commit the government to expenditure. That's what happened in relation to JBS. That is very dangerous and I need you to understand why. If when I call the next election, after I've called the election, when everybody is in election mode, I go round to all the workshops where the government holds the purse strings and I say, guys, you're having a pay rise. And everybody gives me a hug and tells me that they love me, then you as a taxpayer are funding my election campaign. That's why that's what unacceptable. What do you propose to do about this? Will you be, taking, will you be following up the, the situation? I, I'm surprised that you're asking me questions I've already answered. I've said that we are going to take advice on how to advance this matter in court. You've taken advice from the AG no, and no, no. he's told you it's unconstitutional. No, 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 Malen, Where would you take no, it from Malen, here? Uh, sorry, with respect. We've taken advice on whether it is constitutional or not from the Attorney General. We are now taking advice on how to take the matter to court given the advice that we've got. There are many different options on how to go to court and many different potential defendants to the action. And that is what has to be structured properly. This cannot be done willy-nilly. This has to be done absolutely property, properly and with the best possible advice. Um, now we're going to move on to 10 quick questions where we're going to ask you to just say yes or no or very quick answers if possible just for our readers to some of the one-liners. Participants. Participants. Um, means testing for housing, yes or no? No. The state pensionable age for men as per your manifesto, are you going to equalize the age for men to be dropped to 60 as per your commitment? As per manifesto, yes. Will parliament be televised? Yes. Will a solution for parking in the South District be found anytime soon? I hope so. Um, how much of a priority is the homeless for your government? Top. Cervantes Institute, stay or go? Not a matter for the government. Thank you very much for talking to us today. Have a very happy Christmas and all the best to you. Thank you.